Hello everyone, reporting today for Fun Robotics Network, I'm Abhas, and with me here is Team 2153 Silver Wolves from Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. They are currently undefeated this season. They came out of the Pennsylvania Championship as the Inspire Award winner and winning Alliance captain, and perhaps most importantly today is they are the number one teleop specimen robot by OPR and Average. They are just awesome. I think they're playing at a level uh, above just the vast majority of teams this season, and I can't wait to jump into it on Behind the Bot. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Studica Robotics is everything your team needs to build, learn, and compete. Check out their FTC starter kit, intake hub kit, and odometry wheel options at studica.com slash robots. Teams in the USA can get up to 25% off and apply for grants at studica.com slash robots. True competitors know that every second counts. That's why Kettering University challenges you to dive in right away as a first-year student. Participating in robotics programs helps Kettering students secure a valuable co-op. Whatever your interest, Kettering gives you more space to work faster and win faster. Learn more at kettering.edu slash first. All right, Silver Wolf. So I guess my first question uh, is concerning game strategy. I see two robots right there, so we'll touch on that in a second. But first of all is the specimen uh, aspect of the game. Is that something you decided to focus on just very, very early season? Was it something you transitioned to, or would you still consider yourself kind of a dual threat with both sample and specimens? Sure. So we we took this robot to a scrimmage, um, and we only ran specimens at that scrimmage, and that really showed us all of the, the scoring capability that you could have by trying to score for specimens. Um, it wasn't really optimized for either samples or specimens. Um, it had 180 degrees every single time we wanted to score a specimen, and that was a major, that was a major drawback to this robot. Okay, yeah, so got it. Yeah. Really and so, so, yeah, kind of going into the like, at what point did you decide that like we only want to do specimens, or like that's what we're really going to focus on? I would say probably after we kind of we touched base after the scrimmage. So, sorry, I kind of cut you off. Like, this is early in the season, like maybe early December, late November. And we kind of just drew out, oh, where we want our like parts to live. And we drew out on this piece of paper. And we said our 180 degree turns were really not effective. And so we were just plotting out every single piece. And we realized, oh, we can optimize for specimens really efficiently. And that's how we just kind of decided to do this. Okay, awesome. And so now kind of last question about the robot, what were kind of the biggest takeaways? You know, you mentioned the 180 degree turns. Were there anything else you took away from that robot, maybe like footprint or drivetrain, things like that, that you brought over to this new one that, that you think is really important for the audience to know? Sure. So this robot um, has shrunk slides. Um, those were kind of teetering on the edge at that first qualifier that we competed at that caused a lot of stress. So we, one of our design goals for this robot was not to have any string and not having any vertical slides is what that meant. Um, and we accomplished that with this robot. There's no string, there are no vertical slides. And our thing is Yeah, so uh, yeah, jumping jumping into this robot, right? So I guess we're, we're gonna walk through that whole specimen path and kind of where it starts is with the intake. Walk me through generally what degrees of freedom you have in the intake and then we'll jump into the specifics. Sure. So we have a we have an arm here. We have a pitch um, to adjust this angle, and then we also have a yaw to adjust to the angle of samples as we're picking them up. Um, this whole thing is on an extendo um, that has 24 inches of reach, um, so we can pick up like this. And then we also have this entire thing mounted on a mini turret, um, so that we can drop off to the human player station at the same time as we're picking up a specimen from the wall. And then okay. we can yeah, no, that, that, that's fantastic. So, uh, you know, starting with the slides, you said no strung slides. So that's going to be linkage powered. And is that like with two servos, a motor? How are you powering that linkage? This is just powered with a motor, a 60 RPM motor. Okay, got it. And as far as like making sure your motions are very smooth, uh, both when you're extending and retracting, do you have any advice as to teams? Is that something you had to solve with hardware, with software? How'd you approach that? So uh, we had been using run to position on this, but 
tuning that actually turned out to be really difficult. So we went and made a custom PID, which I would recommend for teams because it's a lot more transparent than run position is. You can you sort of know how everything works. You can get in there and mess with it yourself. So we made and tuned that custom PID and it's been working a lot better. So really that's on the software end, what we, were, what we had to do for this. Cool. Yeah. And now talking about the side deposit, right? How close to that 20 inch, um, you know, limit are you guys in, in that horizontal direction? Was that something that really constrained your overall robot width or your arm length, things like that? Or was it not a huge concern? So when we were designing this robot, we knew we couldn't be like 18 inches wide because we've got to fit that sample, obviously. Um, we want it to be small just in general. Um, I think we're at about 19 inches on the extension limit width-wise. So we're not like butting up against it, but we're not, we don't have a whole lot of room. Mm -hmm. I see. And so like, has that, uh, you know, when you're doing your drop-offs, like have you noticed any difficulty with that? Or like you're, you're pretty much always able to get the specimen into the human player zone. I, I noticed there were like a couple cycles that were like really close during the state championship, but for like the most part it was okay. Yeah, if we, if we're not rushing, they generally land in the human player station. Like in practice, we haven't really had any problems with that. Cool. And now talking about that pickup, it was very, very smooth. What's going on there? Any software automation, just a ton of driver practice? Walk me through that. Yeah, so we got two algorithms actually assisting the drivers with the pickups here. First is what we call our fetch algorithm, which shoots out the extendo until it's over a sample and stops it there. So we actually implemented that because making forward back adjustments was taking time. And then we have our auto yaw algorithm, which automatically rotates to fit the sample. And we did that obviously, so you don't have to manual adjust the yaw. Okay, yeah, that's, that makes a ton of sense. And so is it, this is all camera based, I assume? I think I see a camera uh, on the claw over there. Yeah, it's a camera. We chose it because it has a 120 degree field of view. So it's got that really wide field of view and you can see a lot of the sub without having to mount it up way too high. Mm -hmm. And so uh, is this like what type of detection algorithm are you using? So it, it doesn't sound like it's a limelight. So it's your own um, algorithm just like based on color or what what is going on there? Yeah, it's largely color based. We filter for things that are either red or blue depending on the alliance and then basically end up putting rotated bounding boxes around the closest sample and then using trig to detect the angle of that. And then from there you can convert that to a servo position. Okay, got it. And then as far as the uh, like fetch part of the algorithm goes, so it, is that something you're running just like every single loop you're seeing, where is the closest uh, sample that you're looking at? Or are you storing positions at all and like going to them at the next cycle, something like that? No, we're not storing positions because like every time you go in for a pickup, it's going to be different. So it's just shoot it out. And then the second you see something, it's store off that position and set to that. Okay. Okay. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. Awesome. And as far as advice you have to teams looking to implement similar algorithms, what, what were some of like the biggest difficulties you had and how did you overcome them? Well, lighting can be tricky. So the best thing I'd say for that is if you can try and set up your space in a way that mimics competition lighting. So like plentiful overhead lighting, if you can get it, like try not to have it too dark because we've noticed that like, if you have say certain lights off, then it'll mess up and not behave the same way it would at a competition. And also just like it's tuning and practice, like every time something goes wrong with one of your algorithms, like look at, okay, what went wrong? How can we fix it? You actually have the ability to save off images to the control hub and pull them when you're USB connected, which can be really helpful to just see what it was seeing at the time. Awesome, yeah, that, that, that's fantastic advice. And so uh, one thing that I think is really interesting is how these algorithms work alongside your drivers, right? So is this something that is kind of driver activated, like your driver presses a button every time they reach a sub? Is it something that runs automatically as soon as they shoot out the extension? How do you guys make sure this is super smooth? Yes, yeah, so with Fetch, they've got a button to trigger it. And with Auto Yaw, it's a little more complicated. If you're centered, like basically, if they haven't manually adjusted it, then it will use auto yaw. But if they've manually adjusted it, you know, we want to give them the ability to sort of override that. So if it's at one of our like 45 degree adjustments, it won't run. Okay. And last question about the fetch. Are you using the, uh, 
the pitch controller, yeah, kind of you, you, the mini turret uh, to, with the fetch as well, or is the fetch only controlling the extension amount on your horizontal slats? It only controls the extension. Okay, okay, understood. Cool. So now talking about the deposit, I noticed there were a lot of degrees of freedom there as well. Uh, like, yeah, so just some crazy rotational motions going on. So walk me through what's there and then I'm sure I'll have a ton of questions. Sure. So this mini, this whole assembly is mounted on a mini turret so it can spin, spin to the side like that to drop off a people in player. Uh, and what that allows us to do is pick up a specimen at the same time as we're dropping off a sample. Yeah, and after you've picked up the specimen, I see at least, uh, you know, at least three or four degrees of freedom. Can you kind of just walk me through that whole arm chain and what you have going on there? Sure. So this servo powers our claw. Um, this one powers our yaw, so that when we flip up the arm, the flip is facing the right way. And then we also have this pitch to adapt to the, to get the specimen level, no matter what the arm angle is. Okay. Okay, I see. And then, uh, and then just the motor to power everything. That's like another sixty RPM motor. What are we looking at there? It's actually an eighty-four. Um, it started out slower, but then got faster as the season progressed, and we got faster. Mm -hmm. That's that's very neat. Okay, and as far as um, you know, depositing, I I think I've noticed a couple of times that you guys deposit at an angle very often, right? Or you don't need to go perfectly head on to the uh, high chamber. What's going on there? Is that like, how did you realize that? What does that do for you? Just walking through that in general. So it's more just like pathing because as we go back, we're trying to find like the shortest possible distance to make things faster. So as we're coming back from getting our sample from the submersible, we just realize it's much easier for us to go in a straight line versus having to go to like turn, like straight turn or any other sort of like more inefficient pathing. Mm -hmm. Okay, and when you have picked up a specimen from the human player and are depositing it on the high chamber, uh, any driver automations there or entirely just driver practice? It's, well, you are, you go ahead. Oh, so basically, in the beginning of the season, we were talking about strategy and stuff, and we were just like thinking, oh, how can we like put this onto the wrongs? Is it like this way better? Is it this way? Is it this way? And we realized the most efficient way for us is to face it head on and just ram it. And so we don't really need any driver automation because we kind of do not many slides. We don't need to like do anything sort of. We need to flip the arm up, but then we flip the arm up and we just ram it on. So it's really pretty simple. Yeah. Okay. okay. And I guess the, the biggest thing with you guys is like all season, we've been seeing teams that'll do like 11, 12 specimens in a match, they will just pick up all of the, they'll pick up all the blue samples, say, and then they'll just score them all right at the end of the match. But with you, what you do that's very different from other teams is you'll score them throughout the match and then pick up while you're scoring one. At what point did you realize that this strategy is so advantageous for you guys? That's a really good question. So we started kind of, well, we knew we would want to do like pick up pass around and like get something from the submersible. But then at first we were just doing kind of pick up pass around and get something from the submersible like versus like long side and stuff. Like we would score it and then go to the long side and then come back. But then through practice, we realized it was just much more efficient for us to just stay on the short side for most of the time and then score and then immediately get one and then come back to the observation zone. So it was a lot better for us. Yeah, and I think one of the coolest things I saw in your guys' final match, um, you know, with with out of the box was them picking up the specimens on the far side of the submersible and then tri like, you know, passing them over to you guys so you could pick them up while you're scoring your, your previously made specimens. Is that something you anticipate doing with a lot of teams during qual matches at Worlds? Or is that something like you're just really gonna be looking for an alliance partner who can do that or is you just don't see that strategy playing out in Houston at all? I think Ideally, we would see that because we are a lot faster when we're doing those short side pickups. We're also a lot more immune to defense. Um, so it's just, it's better all around, especially for out of the box. They're really fast with it, so it didn't cost them much time. Mm -hmm. So cool. Yeah. And I guess last question for you guys is looking forward to Worlds. Hang is obviously, you know, the, the place where you're going to make up the most points. Any, any plans for level two, level three hang, things you guys want to talk about? Um, we're not currently planning to add a hang, that's partly space and partly weight concerns. 
And what a lot of teams will do is, oh, we have these wonderful vertical scoring slides right here. We'll just hang on those. But like you can see, we don't have any vertical slides. So. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that that makes sense. And, you know, you guys scored, I think, at least two specimens, like, right right in the final, like, five, seven seconds of that last match there. So it really made up the points. Um, but, yeah, Silver Wolves, thank you guys so much. You guys have just really, really redefined the specimen scoring game. Uh, and, and I think it's going to be a strong strategy we see from the top teams uh, coming into Houston. So thank you so much for this interview. Reporting for Fund Robotics Network, I'm Abbas, and this is Team 20153 Silver Wolves. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell to stay up to date on future fun videos. True competitors know that every second counts. That's why Kettering University challenges you to dive in right away as a first-year student. Participating in robotics programs helps Kettering students secure a valuable co-op. Whatever your interests, Kettering gives you more space to work faster and win faster. Learn more at kettering.edu slash first. StudiCut Robotics is everything your team needs to build, learn, and compete. Check out their FTC starter kit, intake hub kit, and odometry wheel options at studica.com slash robots. Teams in the USA can get up to 25% off and apply for grants at studica.com slash robots.